The Sting character had one of the most radical changes in the whole history of pro wrestling, made even more notable due to how popular Sting was and how far the original character had taken Steve Borden in terms of overall success. The blonde Sting, known by fans as Surfer Sting, gave many people a reason to tune into WCW programming. Viewers love seeing the Stinger take on all competitors while fighting the good fight week in and week out. But in the mid-90s, things simply had to change. WCW completely shifted direction when two outsiders joined the company, threatening to take over the entire organization and take away the WCW that Sting flourished in. The Stinger was the first to step up to these outsiders and he made it clear that he was ready for the war that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were about to bring to the company that meant so much to him. While the arrival of the New World Order served as the catalyst for Sting's transformation, it was something else that pushed him over the edge and turned him into a new character. It was the lack of trust the company and his peers had in him when the NWO began playing mind games, and fans were introduced to a new, darker Sting that was heavily influenced by The Crow, a comic book character and movie character that came from the mind of American writer and artist James O'Barr. Let's look at the creation of The Crow version of Sting and let's look at what made the character so successful. On screen, Scott Hall was Sting's enemy, but backstage it was Scott who suggested that Sting changed his character into this dark vigilante. Surfer Sting wore neon colors, he came out to a cheesy but admittedly awesome early 90s rock song with lyrics about how he makes the kids in the audience go wild and how the old people start acting like children when the Stinger's doing his thing. This worked well in the early 90s by the way, and even when the NWO came along, the original Sting character was still immensely popular, but there was a shift going on in pro wrestling where these cartoony characters and white meat baby faces were getting phased out in favour of darker, more gritty and edgy characters that resonated better with the young male demographic. Hulk Hogan even shed his trademark red and yellow gear in an effort to update his overall look for this new era. Randy Savage would soon do the same thing. And while colourful characters most definitely still had a place in pro wrestling, it seemed like adding a little grittiness to a gimmick worked wonders for some of the biggest stars in the business. Scott said that Sting was a little standoffish when he first approached them. Sting didn't know Scott too well at all, and it sounds like Sting thought Scott was maybe poking fun at him at first when Scott talked about Sting's old blonde hair and colourful ring attire, but Scott said he would give advice like this for the betterment of the entire company. If WCW's doing good business, then Scott's doing good business, so he liked to offer his take on things whenever he felt it would improve the television product, according to Scott anyway. Sting took the idea to Bischoff, Bischoff liked it, and the wheels were set in motion to present a new version of the man called Sting. So, to quickly summarise what went down, the Outsiders came along and they had a match with Sting, Lex Luger and Randy Savage. The Outsiders then revealed their third man, and it was Hulk Hogan. The NWO was then born at the end of Bash at the Beach 1996. Sting would continue to fight the good fight on WCW programming, trying to save WCW from this takeover, but the NWO were able to convince Sting's peers and other WCW employees, including the commentators, that the icon had actually joined the group and he was going to fight alongside the NWO in the 1996 War Games match at Fall Brawl. Lex Luger and the Horsemen weren't sure if they believed Sting when the man himself said he wasn't part of the New World Order. Things were made even more confusing when Sting jumped out of an NWO limousine to attack Luger in a parking lot, so the WCW guys felt they had every right to question Sting's motives. But Sting said it wasn't him who attacked Lex and the group needed to believe him if they wanted to overcome the NWO. It was revealed that the NWO had brought in a fake Sting, an imposter that was added to the group just to mess around with the real Sting and Sting's teammates. The real Sting entered war games, he took out the fake Sting, and he demanded to know if this was good enough for Lex and the Horsemen before walking away and leaving his teammates to take a loss on pay-per-view. 
On Nitro the very next night, Sting came out and he addressed his actions before announcing that he was now a free agent. He was disappointed that no one believed him, he was upset that some fans also thought he was part of the NWO after everything he had given to World Championship Wrestling. He called out the announcers for their lack of faith too, and Sting walked away from WCW to pretty much let the NWO do as they pleased. Sting went to Japan briefly to work a few matches and when he came back he wore black and white face paint. You can see that the shape of the face paint still resembled the old Sting in a way, but as time went on the paint would cover more of his face and more black accents were added around his eyes and around his mouth. The NWO wanted Sting to join the group for real and Sting didn't say yes but he also didn't say no. But the only thing that's for sure about Sting is nothing's for sure. And Sting wouldn't talk into the mic again on WCW until January of 1998. Scott Hall didn't read the Crow comics, he watched the 1994 movie starring Brandon Lee, but seeing as the comic serves as the true genesis of the Crow character, we're gonna focus on the comic books here and you're gonna quickly learn that many of the original Crow's characteristics actually match up to the Crow's Sting character in WCW. Now I will be taking some liberties here too, Scott just watched the movie and he thought Brandon Lee looked cool while appreciating the darker tones of the Crow character. The comic book wasn't looked at before, during or after Crow Sting's debut, but I think it's good to look at this character inspiration from the absolute ground level, plus it's more fun. The Crow made his first appearance in Calibre Presents issue number 1, not including any artwork or advertisements made for his first appearance. Calibre Presents issue 1 was published in January 1989, and The Crow appeared in the story Inertia that served as a short prequel and introduction to the character. Over the next few months, The Crow's first limited series was published, four issues that were named Pain, Fear, Irony and Despair, and it was through this first series that readers learned all about The Crow and what the character was all about. A fifth book named Death was unpublished by the way, but it did get released later on. Let's draw some comparisons to The Crow and Sting next, and again, there are some liberties taken here, but everything I say will make sense if you let me indulge you for a moment. Eric, the protagonist in the original Crow comics, is killed by a group of thugs along with his wife. Sting, the protagonist in WCW, is in the middle of WCW getting killed by a group of thugs. Eric is resurrected by the Crow some time later and he plans on getting revenge for the people responsible for killing him and his wife. Sting's character looks to get revenge on the people responsible for killing WCW. I know, I know, the lives of a man and a wife seem like a weird comparison to a wrestling company, but wrestling is weird anyway, so just roll with it. The Crow Sting, at its core, was all about bringing WCW back to what it was by taking out the men who were hellbent on taking it over. In the comics, Eric's makeup is described as joyful. We see a masquerade mask in his house, and Eric takes inspiration from that very mask that hangs on the wall. The original Crow Sting, before he somewhat evolved, had the exact same face paint, more or less, and it worked wonders for this new dark vigilante Sting. Even more so, seeing as Sting used to wear face paint before. Think about it if this was someone who didn't wear face paint before, then it might not have came off as good. In the comics, the crow's abilities, or his magic as it were, the ridiculous strength, the agility and the reflexes, it's all driven by vengeance and at its core it's derived from lost love. The antagonist being separated from someone that meant the world to him, or her in later comics. Sting, meanwhile, is driven by the loss of WCW. Everything he knew was rooted in that company and he was at home in WCW while representing everything that was good. The NWO, the bad guys, were determined to destroy those roots and completely wreck every single tradition and cornerstone that made WCW what it was. And Sting was trying to save all that while also internally dealing with his peers who at one point didn't trust him. 
Speaking of which, Sting didn't do anything to prove how trustworthy he was, instead he made people prove how trustworthy they were. He would offer WCW wrestlers a chance to strike him with his baseball bat, the Stinger's weapon of choice during this era, and if no action was taken then the wrestler was considered Sting's ally. Still though, Sting wouldn't worry too much either about hurting his allies in order to infiltrate the NWO. He even joined the group for a while in order to get closer to Hollywood Hogan and the plan worked very well. Seeing as Sting didn't wrestle during the early days of the Crow gimmick, he would make his presence felt by sitting in the rafters and watching over everything that happened in the ring. He stalked his opponents from high above, keeping an eye on what was going on within the NWO and within the WCW Crusaders that once turned their back on him. Sometimes he could be spotted, other times he was nowhere to be found, but Sting instilled a lot of paranoia within the NWO and it was all very effective both from a storyline perspective and from the perspective of viewers watching at home. No one had done anything like this before and you gotta give Eric Bischoff credit for putting off Sting's eventual return to the ring for as long as he did. When Sting was ready to get back in the ring at Starcade, WCW made a lot of money and the creative booking up until that point was perfect. Anyway, the threat of Sting was always there. Even if Steve Borden was in another city or state, it never had to be explained on TV because his home on TV shows was away from the spotlight anyway. And this whole thing with the icon living in the shadows and striking at the most opportunistic times was what made it all work. The NWO were dominant throughout mid-96 to late 97, but even when they launched attacks on their enemies, they always had Sting in the back of their minds. Was he gonna strike or wasn't he? Would Sting fall for the NWO trap or did he see it coming from a mile off? The fear of Sting played a big part in the early storyline arc and in the case of Hollywood Hogan, the fear of Sting could make someone irrational. To cope with this fear, Hogan would say Sting's actually afraid of Hollywood. Hogan built this fantasy in his mind that Sting was hiding in the shadows because he didn't want to face Hogan one on one. Even when Sting made it clear that he wanted to fight Hogan and no one else, Hollywood still tried to convince himself and anyone that would listen that Sting's the one sitting in the rafters shaking like a leaf, while Hollywood's in the ring looking to settle things once and for all. There was good stuff here and yes, some of this stuff is only really there if you look for it and no doubt a lot of the nuance and tone wasn't intentionally planned by WCW in advance. One could watch Nitro week after week and say it's the same stuff every week with little to no progression, but the numbers don't lie. WCW Nitro destroyed WWF Raw during this time period and a lot of that was thanks to the Sting vs NWO storyline. Sting didn't need to do much and he didn't have to say a thing to still get people to tune in, so it's a classic case of less is more. The anticipation for what was inevitably going to happen was off the charts and it's all down to how WCW presented Sting during this time period. In the comic, Eric's mission was to take out the gang who killed him and his wife one by one before getting to the group's leader, T-Bird. Sting would do the same before getting to the NWO's leader, Hollywood Hulk Hogan. It can be quite difficult to talk about highlights of this gimmick because of the nature of Sting's appearances. Watch episodes of Nitro, hope that Sting strikes the NWO and there you go, you've got a highlight of the crow Sting. Every time he did this the crowd would lose their minds and the excitement of the audience comes across on TV really, really well. And besides, the highlights are made even better because you didn't necessarily know if Sting was going to strike or not. But still, I want to point out some other key moments that go a long way in painting this character and letting us know what he's all about. The Sting promo after Fall Brawl 96 on Monday Nitro is absolute must see for those wanting to study the gimmick and learn about why Sting changed into this dark and mysterious vigilante. Hearing Sting getting angry on a personal level is very different. This one feels much more authentic than his previous promos, so hunt this one down and you'll understand why Sting did what he did. It's one of the more memorable promos of his whole career. The 21st of October 1996 episode of Nitro where Sting gets asked to join the NWO is an important night too. This one's fascinating from a character standpoint because you sort of get half of the old Sting and half of this new Crow Sting. 
We also learn here that Sting isn't going to give away his hand and let the NWO know how he truly feels about them, and we also hear Sting talk for the very last time for nearly a year and a half. WCW uncensored events get a bad rep, but the 1997 edition closed with a great Sting moment. The NWO were victorious in the main event, but just before the show ended, Sting finally showed everyone that his allegiance was with World Championship Wrestling. The Stinger attacked Hall, Nash and Randy Savage, and he also attacked Hulk Hogan as the crowd went nuts. Everyone left the show knowing that Sting was gonna bring the fight to the NWO and eventually he'd be coming for Hollywood Hogan soon and the World Heavyweight Championship. A personal favourite Sting moment of mine happens at the very end of Clash of the Champions 35, the last ever Clash show. The NWO were celebrating their birthday at the end of the event, the lights begin to flicker and this low sustained note played in the arena that really added to the atmosphere. Up in the rafters we could see Sting with a vulture perched on his hand, and then the This Is Sting monologue played for the first time, a monologue that describes Sting's mission and why he seeks vengeance against the NWO. When a man's heart is full of deceit, it burns up, dies, and a dark shadow falls over his soul. From the ashes of a once great man has risen a curse, a wrong that must be righted. We look to the skies for a vindicator, someone to strike fear into the black hearts of the same men who created him. The battle between good and evil has begun. Against an army of shadows comes a dark warrior, the prevailer of good, with a voice of silence and a mission of justice. This is Sting. The Vulture then sits on the ring ropes as the NWO look on in fear, not knowing what to do as that low sustained note continues to play in the arena. On the 13th of October 1997 edition of Nitro, a bunch of fake stings came to the ring at the very end of the show to confront the NWO. These fake stingers had been synonymous with the New World Order and they were used frequently to swerve fans and swerve viewers at home. This time though, one of the fake stings hit Buff Bagwell with a scorpion death drop, only to reveal himself as the real sting afterwards. They pulled this one off really well by playing with your expectations, and the audience absolutely lose their minds when they realise what just happened. Finally, and I know it's a sore point for a lot of people, but the Starcade 1997 main event is worth bringing up. I know the finish was a mess, but Sting's entrance, the stare down in the middle of the ring, the atmosphere inside the arena, it was all undeniably excellent. It's a shame things turned out the way they did, and the ending of the bout definitely overshadows everything else about this match, but the anticipation moments before the bell rings is on another level. Later in the comics, it's said that the crow's abilities are taken away if the antagonist abandons his or her mission, and the abilities also diminish when they consider their mission complete. If we take this and play with it a bit, you could consider Sting's mission coming to an end at Starcade 97 when he defeated the leader of the NWO, because really, the Sting character was never the same again. He would begin to talk a lot more, he wasn't as invincible as he once was, and he didn't seem so much driven to protect WCW but more so to hold on to the WCW championship while the NWO began to implode due to infighting within the group. Sting would eventually abandon the white face paint in favour of a red version when he joined the NWO Wolfpack, and during this time in particular, anything that remotely resembled the white and black version, in terms of his motivations, were completely gone. Yes, the Wolfpack did fight with NWO Hollywood, but Sting wasn't this lone wolf anymore, he wasn't a vigilante that stalked his prey from up in the rafters, he was just like everyone else who had a problem with Hollywood Hogan. Still though, the white and black version of Sting would make a comeback to WCW and he would once again appear from the rafters before taking out his opponents. But again, it wasn't the same, he was tangled up in usual, more traditional storylines that didn't expand upon the core characteristics of the gimmick. 
The same is true for Sting's time in TNA, WWE and AEW, with the only real big deviation being the Joker Sting that appeared in Impact. This character was of course inspired by Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in the 2008 film The Dark Knight, and judging by comments made online, in retrospect, it seems that fans are split on the insane icon. Some fans liked it, others didn't. The crow sting that walked out on WCW Nitro in 1996 though serves as the foundation for the sting we still see on AEW television today, and it proves the overall longevity of the character. Surfer Sting in modern times wouldn't look right at all, so what Scott Hall and Sting did back in 1996 was create a wrestling gimmick that was once maybe a necessity but ended up standing the test of time. Many, many fans grew up with the crow sting and they know very little about his early days. Sting is generational though, and it really doesn't matter which version of Sting you were most fond of or which version of Sting you grew up with, he'll always be one of the most successful and popular superstars of all time. Thanks for watching another edition of Creating a Wrestler, and remember to check out the Raven episode if you haven't done so already. Raven and the Crow Sting are two interesting characters for sure, but I have a lot more of these lined up and I think you're going to enjoy some of the episodes I've got coming to the channel very soon. As always, I'm open to suggestions, let me know in the comments who you'd like to see covered in this series, and if they aren't already on my to-do list, I'll be sure to add your picks. Thanks for watching guys, and take care.